You know you're watching Steven Soderbergh if a scene's audio comes in first before the image catches up to the sound. At the beginning, we often hear a voice while the screen is totally black or displays some abstract image or a wide shot of a location. You know that orange juice you have every morning? You know what's in that? Corn. And when you're good and help with the trash, you know what makes the big green bags biodegradable? Do you? Uh-huh, corn. This signature Soderbergh technique disorients and engages the viewer, dropping us into an atmosphere or feeling before we can actually make sense of what's going on. Once the settings established and the visuals eventually match up with the audio, Soderbergh focuses in on a particular character to anchor us in their personal story. Soderbergh takes his time getting to the plot, choosing to prioritize the introduction of his characters. Aaron Brockovich starts with a job interview that reveals Aaron's charm and her inability to land a job. You got a really nice office. Thanks. Traffic begins with Javier talking about his dream in which he feels powerless to save his dying mother, much like he feels powerless to stop the crime and corruption in his native Tijuana. And Ocean's Eleven shows us how calm and charismatic Danny is in any situation. Be aware, this video may contain a few spoilers for Soderbergh movies. Soderbergh's sustained close-ups make us feel intimately connected to his characters. Directors traditionally use close-ups during a pivotal emotional point, but Soderbergh gives us close-ups on off moments, like when the character isn't speaking. He lingers on a character's feelings, making their emotions a part of the visual storytelling. In Sex Lies in Videotape, when Anne discovers Cynthia's pearl earring on the floor of her bedroom, this confirms her suspicions that her sister's having an affair with her husband. The moments leading up to and through this painful realization are patiently documented by the unwavering camera. When she impulsively tries to smash the earring, the focus of the close-up shifts to the earring on the floor, since it's no longer her expression but her action on the earring that communicates her feelings at that moment. In Magic Mike, as the men socialize in the dressing room, we keep cutting back to this close-up of Mike's long, pensive gaze. The shot wordlessly includes us in his thought process, as he decides whether or not to leave the club and his stripping career altogether. Soderbergh's technique of playing a new scene's audio over the previous visual is particularly effective with his sustained close-ups. The delay suggests that although life continues to go on as usual, the character is still mentally stuck in that moment of deep thought and feeling. A poignant example is in Traffic. After after Judge Wakefield's conversation with the chief of staff. Don't worry about that thing with your daughter. Anyway, if it came out, uh, we could turn it into a qualification. I have been in the trenches of the drug war. I've seen the face of the enemy, etc., etc. The conversation follows Wakefield into his next scene, and he seems to be replaying the words over and over again in his head, as he finds himself unable to make the speech he planned. Soderbergh gives us the sense that we're voyeurs, entering hidden or illicit worlds. Instead of feeling immersed, as we do with many films, especially in the action genre, we feel rather like we're observing from just outside of the action, given a window into things we shouldn't be seeing. Imitating the gaze of someone spying on a stranger, Soderbergh will take a wide shot on a character and follow that character uninterruptedly. Like human eyes fixed on a moving object, he'll position the camera so the character starts far away at one side of the screen, then follow them as they approach the camera, often crossing right in front of it before distancing themselves a little so we get a better view of them. The voyeuristic feel also comes from shooting conversations through obstructions or using over-the-shoulder shots, often at an angle that makes us feel like we're an extra guest, eavesdropping on the conversation from slightly further away than the participants. We're present to its intensity, but the shoulder head or material blocking our view reminds us we're not meant to be the recipient of these words. In the same vein, Soderbergh might leave out the expected establishing shots or conventional coverage that most directors use. Instead, he might stick the camera in one place and film most of a scene from one vantage point, making us feel like we're really in the room because we're not constantly skipping around to different parts of it. And he's very comfortable using jump cuts instead of cutting away to hide skips forward in the action. Soderbergh's frequent jump cuts counter his focus on the individual by providing providing the pace of an action film. Like a selective fast-forward function, oh, jump cuts create momentum and the heightened reality of action-like entertainment. All these camera techniques together give his visuals a handheld documentary feel, emphasizing that he's giving us windows into real-feeling worlds that we don't usually get to see but are curious about. We get a glimpse into the lives of people in marginalized or taboo situations. Soderbergh humanizes characters we often dismiss or reduce to a type, like an escort, a male stripper, or a single mother who doesn't dress 
us like a saint. The director plays on our desire to fetishize these people, but he's also showing them to be complex or different than we expect, defying cliches and revealing depth to their personalities that take us by surprise. In Traffic, Javier has a profound sense of loyalty and justice, but he finds that the right thing to do isn't clear cut when he's surrounded by corruption everywhere. In Aaron Brockovich, we come to respect Aaron's refusal to act, speak, or dress as people expect her to. While it makes it easy for others to underestimate her, it shows a brave confidence in her own intuitions and style of doing things. Well, it just so happens, I think I look nice. And as long as I have one ass instead of two, I'll wear what I like if that's all right with you. In The Girlfriend Experience, Christine treats her occupation like any other business in the service industry, and we might be taken by surprise by her high level of professionalism. The calm, understated, business-minded Christine is the opposite of the flashy, loud personality we might expect coming into a story about an escort. And in Magic Mike, Mike too has been underestimated by others, and indirectly by us at first as we come into the movie with certain assumptions. We learn that Mike has ambitions like starting his own custom furniture business, and he's a sensitive caring guy looking for a meaningful relationship. The surprise can go in the other direction too, as we see in Traffic when an upstanding pregnant mother is willing to smuggle drugs and order a hit in order to keep her family intact. It makes the political or social into a personal story. Many of Soderbergh's plots center around broad global issues like crime, drugs, illness, and poverty, but these big issues are filtered through individual stories. Soderbergh shows how a social issue looks from the inside to a person directly affected by the problem. Striking this balance between the macro view of global issues and the micro view of individuals, his thesis often seems to be that these big political problems can only be solved by remembering that society is made up of individuals. People are both the cause of and the solution to society's ills, and true progress may only come about one by one, person by person. Many of his characters are on a mission to fight some injustice, yet the big fight is always personal. Not personal? That is my work! My sweat, my time away from my kids, if that's not personal, I don't know what it is. Erin Brockovich knows what it's like to be the victim. Thus, her drive to vindicate the victims of PG&E is fueled by genuine understanding and personal emotion. Traffic illustrates how the US government's war on drugs becomes an intimate family issue, showing that it's easy to hate a faceless problem, but much harder to battle an enemy so close to home. While he's made plenty of star-studded Hollywood fare, Soderbergh also works with non-actors on experimental low budget indies. He even secretly shot a film on an iPhone. In addition to directing, he also acts as editor, writer, and DP on many films. But to avoid giving himself too many credits, he likes to use pseudonyms drawn from variations on his parents' names, Mary Ann Bernard and Peter Andrews. The remarkably prolific Soderbergh has shown an aptitude for a wide variety of film genres, from the action and heist movie to the social drama, mystery, romance, or comedy. Many of his films blend several of these genres. Soderbergh Soderbergh achieves subtle humor by making images play in counterpoint with words. Duck, thank you very much. Helena, you never order duck. I know, I know. Well, it's not mm. me who ordered it. Mm. Somebody else. Mm. Uh, well, he or she has very good taste. Often, he'll follow up a character's speech with a contrasting image to illustrate in a tongue-in-cheek way the difference between a character's perspective and how things really are. The discrepancy between a character's words and their actions can also reveal a depth to their character, as it does when Erin tells her kids she's not eating dinner with them at the diner. Oh, you're not eating? Well, my lawyer took me out to a fancy lunch to celebrate, and I'm still stuffed. How about that? <laughs> the very next shot proves she's lied. 16 is the number of dollars I have in my bank account. So we sympathize with her and respect the brave face she puts on for her family. Soderbergh likes washing his frames in blue or yellow or another color, often using the interplay of these contrasting palettes to illustrate opposing forces in his plots, both between and within characters. In Magic Mike, the everyday and backstage life of the performers is colored in yellow, while their onstage moments strongly feature blue. So the opposing colors underline the contrast between their stage personas and their private selves. In Traffic, Soderbergh distinguishes the different threads of his plot with color, yellow for the Mexico story, a cold monochrome blue for the East Coast story, and an unfiltered tungsten for San Diego. The colors create not only a mood, but also a psychological identity for each location. Tijuana's sepia-tinged wash captures the heat and looks like it was shot on old film, reminding us of the frontier of old westerns, which also feature prominent yellows. The exaggerated cold look of the East Coast 
Coast story shows that Judge Wakefield's political war on drugs is worlds away from the trade it's trying to crack down on, and it underlines the isolation, loneliness, and alienation of his daughter's descent into addiction. The more balanced color scheme of the San Diego plot corresponds to the facade of normalcy in Helena's life before she realizes her husband's involvement in drugs. When she crosses into Mexico to plot murder to free her husband, she enters into the Mexico yellow wash in the most significant scene that shows what her survival instincts make her capable of. And I want the principal witness against my husband, Eduardo Ruiz, killed. The way that the characters ultimately cross over into the other colors comes to show how they are, at their core, not truly divided, but connected. In other films, Soderbergh uses a blue tinge or yellow tinge on a more case-by-case -case basis to depict a range of atmospheres, moments, or emotions. Yet it's striking how often he does apply such a dramatic monochrome wash to his visuals to express the mood he wants. In The Nick, Soderbergh uses the contrast of black and white to create the sterile, austere environment of the hospital. The heightened contrast plays into how the themes and conflicts of the series develop. Soderbergh has a penchant for films about vengeance or retribution and justice. Whether or not the characters succeed and how they define justice can vary widely between films. And Soderbergh often gives us mixed, unresolved endings. Aaron succeeds, but Soderbergh's other characters get more mixed results as they struggle against broken systems to overturn the established way of things or bring about a better way of life. More typical of Soderbergh's films are endings with conditional happiness, or they're sad but not necessarily necessarily tragic, there's usually a somber taste of reality. Even in Ocean's Eleven, which mostly feeds our desire for escapist fantasy, some reality re-enters at the end when Danny Ocean takes the fall for the rest of his team and goes to prison. Overall, Soderbergh's endings are rarely neat, giving us a sense that the character's struggle against a personal or universal issue is not over and may never end. In Traffic, Monty realizes that his actions might not make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things, but he doesn't give up, continuing the battle to avenge his friend's death. The key is to keep trying, even if results are small and slow. By the end, our focus isn't on the often unresolvable global issue, but back on the individual. And Soderbergh's final question to us is whether we think the character has succeeded. Soderbergh masterfully blurs the lines between personal and universal, between intimate drama and large-scale action film, between humor and tragedy. Soderbergh's art expertly captures the liminal, multifaceted, uncategorizable nature of our human existence. Because a house always wins. Play long enough, you never change the stakes, the house takes you. Unless, when that perfect hand comes along, you bet big, and then you take the house. Yeah.